Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Didier Bonnet. You're very welcome. <clears throat> this is the book, and later on people can buy it next door. You'll sign them. First of all, before I explain it, what did you do in this book? You spoke to about 150 top executives, didn't you, about how they went for digital transformation, the key right. lessons. Yeah. Tell so me we, about we that. So we took to, so the, the, the starting point with, uh, so I, I wrote this, uh, this book with uh, two colleagues from the MIT, uh, and we, we sort of got together and, and figured out that, you know, everything we were reading about digital uh, was around uh, very traditional tech companies, startups, mm. and, and a lot about Silicon Valley. Okay. And, and when we tally up all these, uh, you know, software, uh, startups, even Apple and Google, it's about 6% of the world economy. So we're going to say, okay, hang on a second, you know, there's 94% of the rest of the world, which probably employs even more than 94%, is not being talked about. And one of the fundamental beliefs we had is that this, this um, digital wave is, is going to be, uh, you know, it's not like the dot-com bubble, it'll come and go. That we actually fundamentally believe it's going to be transformational for industries and societies of the kind of what electricity and, and, and railways were, you know, in, in, in the old days. So, so it's going to be a profound change, and, and nobody was really looking at traditional companies, global companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, uh, and the companies in, in pharmaceutical, in manufacturing, and so on. So we, we decided to focus on the sort of the boring side of the economy, uh -huh. if you will, mm -hmm. and try to see, are these guys doing exciting things with digital technology, and, and what are they actually doing? Because it can be quite intimidating. If you're uh, you know, a chief executive, or if you're running your own business, you're so busy trying to get the business to function, right. or to run a large company, isn't it? One of the things, I read your book in Dingle recently, actually, and I took down, one of the things you talk about in your book is about digital masters, mm -hmm. the companies that excel at digital transformation. Tell me, what is the DNA of a digital okay. master? So, so, the, the, so the term digital master we, we sort of made up and <laughs> didn't, didn't know what, what else to call them. But the, we were looking for really, uh, you know, it says, are they in this like wide sphere of global companies? Uh, are they companies that are actually introducing this technology better than others? Mm. And if yes, what are they doing differently? So the, the DNA in, in, in your terminology. And the good news is we did find some companies that actually were doing that extremely well. The less good news is that there were a few of them. Uh, so there was a minority. Um, and, and really when we start scratching, you know, we sort of say, okay, what, what, what is it at a high level they're doing very differently? Uh, and obviously we, we, f we found two dimensions that were really driving uh, success. One was the very obvious one is that in order to be a, a digital master, you have to invest in digital technology. So, um, you know, mobile, social, analytics, uh, I mean, you name it, you know, all, all these kind of technologies that are available today, you have to make, uh, you know, a commitment and, and leadership commitment to actually invest in the technology. But that's kind of the easy part. That, so we, we, we found loads of companies doing that and not making any progress. The second part that was much more interesting is we found those companies, it's a, it, it was in the ways that they were actually transforming the organization. Okay. And it was back to really fundamentals of management, uh, you know, so vision, uh, engagement of people, uh, uh, governance, uh, you know, and, and the last one was in particular how the IT and technology community was actually working with the business. You know, the, uh, the, the technology community and organization has had the monopoly of introduction of technology. This mm. is over. Okay, today everybody, I mean, we've seen it with the, the prior example. You know, you need to live technology and breathe technology with everything you do, whether you're in marketing or in strategy or in manufacturing. So, so, the, so this diffusion is creating a different way uh, for, for technology and IT and business people to work together, and that was a key determinant of, of success. So really what we found was there were, you know, it's not just about investing in, in the technology technology itself, because as long as you've got money, everybody can do that, uh, and there are plenty of vendors that are, that are willing to help, and I've got great technology. It's really about how do you affect change in your organization. Uh, in particular, one of the problems that we've designed organization in sort of silos is the, mm. the word that's used, but bas basically by functions or departments. Uh, we've cut them by countries and then by regions. So you have all these division, and the problem with digital is that it works kind of that way. So you can't, I'm sure, you know, if, if we were to talk about uh, your, your, even at the startup level, you have to really think about, you know, marketing, manufacturing, mm -hmm. delivery, distribution, you know, on a global scale. So it really is, is complex because it forces um, people from different silos, if you will, in organization to talk to each other. And this is not a natural act in organization. Well, from your experience then, did you give me an example maybe of two companies who mastered their digital transformation and maybe the key lessons people could learn from that here today? Okay. So, so, the, um, so what was interesting when we, when we looked at those 
companies that do that well is that we, we found, first of all, that they were across all industries. So we didn't see more in B2C or B2B. We didn't see more in exciting segments uh, rather than, you know, you know that uh, more less exciting segment or more stable industry. They were everywhere. And, and we found companies that are uh, well-known like, you know, Nike, Starbucks, Burberry's, I mean, all, all the companies that, that, uh, that everybody in this room is, uh, uh, knows and, 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 and use on a daily basis. Um, and those were interesting companies because they they'd really tried to, they really invested a lot of time to get not only the customer experience sorted out, but also the operation, the, the, the mm. side that customers don't see, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of if you take Starbucks, for instance, in terms of payment, instead of being able to link in Wi-Fi to get content yeah. uh, as you're in the shop. So all this experience was sorted out. So, so we found these companies that are, that are kind of very visible, but we found also another set of companies that you probably, nobody in this room probably ever heard about. You know, it's Asian Paints, for instance, is the biggest coating company in Asia. They basically do white paint. So, you know, you can't get more stable than uh, doing white paint. And yet they were doing uh, tremendous work. It's an engineering company. It's run by very uh, engineering-led people. So they started by really digitizing their operations, so the entire, so the entire supply chain. We found a company like Codelco, which is a Chilean copper mining company, government-owned. Okay. So when you talk about digital transformation, you, yeah. you probably would go to Silicon Valley and look for example. You wouldn't go to Chile in a government-owned mining company. Yet these guys have done a fantastic um, uh, you know, work, in term, not just in terms of putting technology into their minds, but in terms of fundamentally changing the way you run mines, you know, be, being able to run, a mile from, um, to run a mine completely from about 200 miles away. Uh, because for one simple reason, because they couldn't get the engineer to go to the mine. The young engineer that they yeah. wanted to hire wanted to be in Santiago, not in yeah. 200 miles away in the middle of nowhere. So that's the, 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 one of the reasons they did it. But they really fundamentally changed mining to the point where they are able today to do mining much deeper and much cheaper than, than other mm -hmm. companies with nobody underground. Okay. Which, which really uh, uh, solves a lot of safety problem mm -hmm. and, and environmental problems. So, so, and and what, what was common with these, these companies was that somebody somewhere had a vision about what they, were, they wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, that was a, a very interesting aspect. And when I say vision, it's an overused word. But what, what I mean is that people had, uh, you know, like the, the Codelco example, people had decided that they could use this technology to fundamentally change the way that mining was done, like trucks, you know, why, why trucks were, were you know, mm. those large trucks, of it, they, they have no drivers. Uh, so they really said, okay, what can we do with the technology that's available today? And, and really, from one, from one vision of, of saying, let's automate, uh, to some extent, some of these operations, or in the case of, of Nike, you know, let's, let's actually create an ecosystem where we can get all the information on runners and, and all this kind of stuff. People had a vision about not maybe the next 15 years, but at least the next two or three years, what can we provide in terms of experience or in terms of operation that we be very different. Mm -hmm. um, and as you do that, what you find is the more you introduce technology, and it must be the same in, it's the same in startups, because I talk to a lot of startups and they tell me that. They say, you know, you can see the first two steps. Once you do the first two steps well, another 20 appear. You know, ah, yeah. now, now that we can do that, we can do that. You know, so that's how you evolve your vision over time. So it's not a matter of saying, you know, these guys were visionary because they could see the next 20 years, but they had a way to guide their organization towards a goal. Uh, and I think that was, that was critical. And today, the, the, the other thing is that, you know, you need to bring people with you. So if you're a global company across 100 countries, it's how do you actually engage people? And people talk a lot about engagement, but without some of the tools that are available today uh, in terms of communication, in terms of video, uh, uh, you know, and so on, you can actually engage thousands of people reasonably easily, provided that you have the, the leadership to do so, basically. Yeah. But if you have the leadership mm -hmm. and if you become mm -hmm. a digital master, does it affect the bottom line of profitability? I mean, isn't that right. key for a lot of people? Like, <laughs> that's, oh, that's sounds a, great. That's a good business question, and, and, and that's a question we got all the time, you know, even when we managed to convince people about the yeah. two dimensions. Sounds lovely. All this say, oh, it sounds lovely, but how, you know, what do I say to my shareholders yeah. uh, about the benefits? So what we did, I mean, it's a, it's a tough question because we're, you know, if in this digital transformation world, we're probably right at the beginning of the curve. So it's a kind of the, uh, Andy, uh, my, my colleague, my co-author said, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I think is totally right. I mean, we're really at the start of what's, of what's going to happen. So how do you measure? And we've had the last three years for anybody who's in marketing, the question about ROI of social, ROI of, you know, whatever, you know, it's been, it's been on the, on, on the, so, so it's very hard to, to measure. So what we did is we basically apply the screening to about 400 firms 
in, in other words, we sort of ranked all these 400 firms according to our methodology. And then rather than ask the CEOs or the people running the firm, we went outside and picked up financial data and tried to correlate that. And we found that the two dimensions were driving slightly different performance. So the more you invest in technology like social, mobile, and so on, the more you get um, a return on your uh, sales uh, um, efficiency. So in other words, you can sell more with the same number of people. Okay. But it's, it, it, even for digital masters, it's around 9%. So interesting, but not hugely exciting. What it got really exciting is when we look at the, the leadership dimension, you know, the, the vision, yeah. the engagement, the way that you, you, you change the way of working with technology. That was driving profitability. And, and the gap there, were, or the advantage there, was 26%. So it started getting, particularly the CFOs that we were talking to, quite interested about those benefits. So what, what, what the world of warning that I want to put is these are correlations. So we cannot prove for sure that it is because they did digital that they get 26% mm. benefit. It could be that the best work run company in the world are actually doing digital first. But I would say, as, 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 uh, in my case as a consultant, but in your case as, as leaders of businesses, it doesn't matter because what we're trying to learn is what do people that do that well do differently. So, so, uh, so, but but we're, we're fundamentally convinced that a lot of this 26% is due to, to the digital because we've, we've, you know, we mm. looked at mm. companies like Burberry. I mean, you just look at our financials, Nike, Codelcos. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious how they've, they've managed to gain a, a real true bottom line benefit from that. In terms of mistakes, companies with their digital transformation, what are the key mistakes you've noticed companies have made that people here should avoid? Right. So, so we've, seen, we've seen many. Uh, I would say the first one is to do nothing. Okay. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I still meet people that are not because they, they don't see. Everybody tells me nowadays, which wasn't the case four years ago, but every CEO I meet now is say, you know, digital is uh, number three on my agenda or number one or number two. And, and my next question is, okay, so what are you doing about it? Oh. And, uh, and they say, well, uh, you know, I'm going to wait until the competitors do things and then oh. I'll see. You know? and, and so this kind of wait and see status yeah. quo, that is a big mistake uh, because this world is, is moving extremely fast and, and, and also it takes, you, you don't transform an organization overnight. It takes uh, you know, two, three, four years to actually effect real change. And if you let your competitors do that first and they, and they do it well, they will get 26% over the next four years advantage oh. over you. So you probably don't want to. Uh, so it's time, time to act is really now. So that's a, the that's a first mistake. The second one is to treat this project as technology project. So it's like, oh, digital, go to my IT guy and you know, he will tell you all the great products because it doesn't work that way. It's, uh, it really it engages people, it engages processes, it, engages, it happens at the marketing angle, it happens in manufacturing. It's about revenue generation, but it's also about cost reduction. You can actually reduce costs tremendously by using some of these digital tools. So it covers the entire palette of what a, an organization does and therefore uh, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. if you treat it just solely as a technology project, you, you will never get the benefit of, of that. And it also creates a huge problem, it's like who owns it? Uh, which is why we're hearing a lot about this new title of chief, di chief digital officers in many companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are struggling to say, okay, who owns this thing if it's so cross-functional? Yeah. And yet in your book, you talk a lot about strong leadership and clear vision yeah. are key to the success, but they're almost the key to success to all success, aren't they, in a sense? Or is it just focused, do you think, on digital transformation? Would you mean leadership? Is it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, so, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting because we were, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the people, uh, so, so the professors at the MIT are quite technology aware, so we were looking originally for a, a technology ha-ha in terms of <laughs> what made the difference. And actually we ended up with a fairly uh, uh, managerial ha-ha, which is this, this leadership message. And what we found, when we started the, the, the research, one of our big assumptions is, is, was we were looking at, you know, bring your own device, innovation at the edge, open innovation, uh, Generation Y coming into the organization and shaking the trees and all. So we say, okay, there's going to be this grand wave of, of change happening bottom up through this kind of edgy people mm. coming into organization and change. What happens? We found zero example of that. Zero out of 400 companies. It doesn't mean, by the way, that it's not useful to have young people in your organization. <laughs> it's absolutely essential. But what it means is that in order to fundamentally transform an organization, it needs to be led from the top down. Uh, and, and, and when I say led, I mean the vision, I mean the engagement, I mean the, you know, the, the, the hiring of the, of the talent and the skills. And, and that really is, is you know, one of the fundamental drivers. I mean, when, when we walked into 
Burberry and we saw Angela Ahrens who was the, the CEO mm. of them. You could see the, the, this woman was driven and she's not a technology person, she's a fashion person, but she understood the technology uh, leverage she could get uh, in, in terms of their operation. When, when we walked into Cadelco, he was actually the CIO who was driving the, the change, but he was a passionate person uh, and, and his key things was actually uh, capabilities, people. Mm. He, was really, he was a CIO, but he was driving by people. So these people are real leaders of, of, of teams, of organization, and, and, and the ability actually to, to, you know, to envision, engage, and, and change fundamentally how the organization work was really what made the difference. Uh, and a lot of the companies there, you mentioned it here, like you mentioned Nike, you mentioned Burberry, I mean, they're just global conglomerates. Right. Yeah. For people perhaps involved in smaller businesses, yeah. smaller organizations, is the digital transformation A, as important, and B, as easy or easier than if it's not a huge organization? It's, it's, uh, so it's probably, if you don't have uh, 100 countries, you've only got one, it's clearly easier mm. uh, in terms of that. But you don't, the cultural challenge is still there, the people challenge is still there. Uh, so it, it's still not easy. It's easier, but not, not easy. But we have, we have found companies uh, that are, you operate only in, in one region and uh, that have been very successful at, at doing that. It's probably, it reduces the complexity for mm. sure. And, and I think it's really important. So you, the second part of your question was, do they have to do the same yeah. trip? <laughs> yes, I think, I think they do for the reason that, that you've mentioned earlier on, is that the, you know, this world is global. So you can become, we use the term in the, uh, with my MIT colleagues of uh, global micronational. You know, and, and the micronational is because you can actually run a global operation with five people. As, as you've demonstrated uh, you know, a few minutes ago, it is possible. I mean, if you look at the, some of the companies that are being valued at 10 billion, 15 billion, mm. or whatever today being acquired by the big tech giant, there's like 20 people, 30 people, 100 people if it's a big one. You know, mm. So you can actually run operations globally. And so it doesn't matter which country you're in, you know, these people are going to come to you. Uh, because, um, you know, unfortunately, the consumers are not looking at regions anymore. They're looking at, you know, I love this site. I'm going to go on it. I don't care even where these people are located. It doesn't, doesn't bother me. I care about what they do and the experience I get by, by working with them. What do you think is the one single key most important thing for someone maybe starting out on the digital transformation of their own company? I would say it's, it's aligning, um, aligning a group of people around a first clear vision of how do we start. You know, because you can, you can spend hours strategizing in a room and going off site about the next 10 years and whatever, but nobody knows what, I mean, I didn't mm. know what, what, five years ago what's happening today and I, nobody can forecast that. What we do know is that the flow of technology that's gonna come out is gonna have a major impact and that the next five years are gonna be if we think this has been amazing, it's going to be even more amazing. I mean, if you look at augmented reality, 3D printing, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, I mean, we've not, not seen anything yet about the p potential of that. So, so the, the key thing is how, you know, we're a manufacturing company in Ireland. Mm. How, do we, how do, what do we have to do? Well, get your team focused on what is the first thing that we can do. And sometimes it doesn't matter where you start. It could be uh, revamping your, your, your entire front end going online. It could be about streamlining your operation and your supply chain. It doesn't matter where you start, but start putting these technologies into, into the business for business purposes, not for the love of technology, for business purposes, and look at your capabilities. Uh, because the people that uh, actually are, are, are born digital tend to look at businesses in very different ways. And uh, I was yesterday with a, uh, the, the ed chief editor of a, of a big newspaper here in Ireland, and he was telling me exactly that. He says, what really changed the culture is when I brought all these young guys, because mm. they saw the world very differently. So the mix, and it doesn't mean it's, it's only young guys, it's the mix is how to get this mix of experience and new ways of looking at things. That's, that's really the, the secret sauce if there's a, uh, if there's a term that, that, that works for that. Final question from me to you, and later on you are coming back and we'll throw it to the audience. But I suppose we've been through a major recession here in Ireland, mm -hmm. hopefully we're coming out of it now, but for companies here today listening who perhaps have been struggling or have been working very hard to just keep profitable, tell them why it's critical that they need to make a digital transformation if they haven't already done so. Because you do believe it is critical to make that transformation, don't you? Yes, I, I think in, in whatever industry you, you are, and uh, so I, I spent, just for, for my disclosure, I used to run telecom and media, so I spent a lot of time in music. Okay. Uh, and I, saw, I was stuck for years in the music industry trying to find a solution, and we couldn't. 
Uh, so you don't want to be there, you know, and there are mm. a few industries that are starting to be in this kind of traumatic way of there is actually no solution except looking at your sales going that way, yeah. which is a, not, a, not a nice place to be. So I think because every industry will be impacted, you, you, you know, the, the, this wait and see kind of game will, will not work. So what I would encourage to do is to experiment. It, it, by the way, some of this stuff doesn't require hundreds of million investments. You can experiment reasonably cheaply. You can hire a bunch of guys that know about uh, mm. uh, webs and, and, and application. There's a lot of these applications actually free on the web. You can use them. Uh, and and uh, so, it, so it does cost money eventually, but it's not a huge bet the ranch type of investment. I would encourage people to experiment because that's another uh, cultural trait that we've seen a lot in the, in the digital masters is this notion of experimentation. So even if you're not sure whether your industry is going to be impacted, or whether you're, you, know, you, you, you have enough money to, to invest. Uh, you know, I, I would experiment and don't forget that it's also, look at your cost base because there's a lot of things that people are doing uh, today that can be substantially reduced by using a digital solution. So this notion of thinking digital first. Mm. Um, a lot of processes that we have today that cost a fortune were designed with assumptions that are about 30 years old. So don't look at the process and retweak the process so you get 1% advantage. Look at the assumptions that you might find 20% uh, gain in cost or, or in advantage. So that's, that's the way I would look at the problem. Okay, great to do. You're going to come back up later and I'm going to throw questions to the audience. That's your book, Leading Digital. And just to say, I know Frank Dillon in this Decision magazine did a very good interview with you as well with the Irish Times. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, Didier Bonnet. Thank you very much. Thank you.